Vertigo myth. BPVV is diagnosed when you perform a Dixal Pike test, the patient gets dizzy, and you see nystagmus. Hi, Peter Johns here along with Epley. I'm a Vertigo enthusiast and emergency physician working in Ottawa, Canada. As is my custom, I'll first give the short answer as to why this is a Vertigo myth. Although the patient getting dizzy and seeing their nystagmus is an integral part of a positive Dixal Pike test, there's more to it than that. The gold standard for the diagnosis of BPPV is to have a patient with a clinical presentation that's consistent with BPPV and then during the Dix-Hallpike test to see the correct pattern of nystagmus to confirm the diagnosis of posterior canal BPPV. And here it is, vertical upward nystagmus and rotatory towards the downward ear. Now if you should see horizontal nystagmus as seen here, that means your patient may have horizontal canal BPPV and this is not a positive dix Pike test. Don't perform the dix Pike test on patients with spontaneous or gaze evoked nystagmus because they don't have posterior canal BPPV and performing a dix Pike test on them will only make your patient feel worse and confuse you. A vestibular migraine is very common. It can present a lot of ways and one of those ways is very much like BPPV except the nystagmus produced during a dix Pike test would not be consistent with BPPV. And lastly, there are some very rare central causes of vertigo that can exhibit nystagmus during the dix Pike test, but again, they will not have the typical presentation of BPPV or the nystagmus of posterior canal BPPV. Now if that's all clear to you, that's fine, class dismissed. But if you want to hear a more detailed answer, here we go. Be warned, even Epley fell asleep during this video. So let's dig deeper about why we do a Dix-Hallpike test. Its purpose is to diagnose the most common cause of vertigo in pretty much every clinical setting. As I've already said, that is posterior canal BPBV. First, the patient has to have a clinical presentation consistent with BPBV, and that's having brief, roughly 20 second episodes of vertigo, although it can be as short as five seconds or even longer than one minute, which are brought on by head movements such as turning over in bed or getting in or out of bed. They can also be brought on by looking up or bending over. And their dizziness episodes resolve if they stay still. While this is generally true, there are some people who state that they still feel dizzy even when they're still, but not like when they roll over in bed or get in or out of bed. And some people will stay nauseated or sweaty for 5 or 10 minutes after their short vertigo episode, prompting them to say that they were dizzy for 10 minutes, when they're really only having intense vertigo for 20 or 30 seconds. And they shouldn't have nystagmus when sitting still and, and looking straight ahead or when you ask them to look off to either side 30 degrees. And they shouldn't have concerning features for central vertigo such as the ones listed here. New significant headache or neck pain, unable to stand or walk unaided, focal weakness or paresthesias, dysarthria, diplopia, dysphagia, dysmetria, dysphonia, or spontaneous vertical nystagmus. People who have any of these features need diagnostic imaging and possible referral to specialist care. If your patient has a typical clinical presentation of BPBV which resolves at rest and doesn't have spontaneous or gaze evoked nystagmus and screens negative for central features, then it's time to proceed to the dix Pike test. This test is testing the patient's right ear. You'll see a couple of seconds of what's called the latency where nothing's happening and then the patient clenches her eyes for a second and gives out a whoop. Now you can see the vertical upward nystagmus, which also has a rotatory component towards the downward right ear. I repeat part of this video and also slow down. Look at the small blood vessels of the medial aspect of a right eye to see the rotatory component. It lasts about 10 seconds. This is a classic positive dix Pike test, and when paired with the fact that our clinical presentation was entirely consistent with PPBV, then this is indeed the gold standard for diagnosing posterior canal PPBV and there's no need for imaging these people. You can't see the autolysts rolling around the semicircular canal on a CT head. It's worth noting that another feature of a positive dix Pike test is that if a patient's eyes are looking more towards their downward ear, their nystagmus appears almost completely rotatory. If they're asked to look towards their upward eye, it becomes more vertical. You should be aware of this so that if you see it, you'll recognize it as regular old posterior canal BPBV and not get worried. Unfortunately, videotaping a dix Pike test and putting it in the patient's chart is not always so easy. We have to be able to describe the correct pattern of nystagmus in the chart so that it'll be well documented that the patient actually had posterior canal PPPV. To just say, 
the Dix Hall Pike test was positive with the head turned to the left is not a convincing diagnosis. So you should chart in the patient's record that they had vertical upward and rotatory nystagmus during the Dix Hall Pike test. The next thing you should do is also chart that you performed an Epley maneuver to cure the patient. Hopefully your charting will look something like this, because if you perform the Epley maneuver on the right patient the right way, after 15 minutes of sitting upright, if you retest the same side with the Dix Hall Pike test, 80% of patients will have no nystagmus and no dizziness. If they are still having vertigo and nystagmus, repeating the Epley maneuver will cure about 90% of patients. When clinicians use the term BPBV without any qualifications, they are usually referring to posterior canal BPBV, which as I said is the most common variety of BPBV and responds very well to the Epley maneuver. But in fact, there are two other semicircular canals besides the posterior one, the horizontal canal and the anterior canal. And horizontal canal BPBV, while rarer than posterior canal, may be up to a third or more of cases of BPBV. Because horizontal canal BPBV can spontaneously resolve faster than posterior canal BPBV, specialized dizzy clinics that don't see vertigo patients promptly usually report seeing a smaller percentage of horizontal canal BPBV than those seen in the emergency department. Often the number quoted is 5 to 10 percent. The story for horizontal canal BPBV is often very similar to posterior canal although they do tend to be more symptomatic, that is, they are dizzy for a longer time and often have very strong vertigo. They may say that just turning their head while upright will bring on a strong attack. This doesn't happen with posterior canal. Also, they may say that turning over in bed on either side makes them dizzy. Have a look at this dix hall -Pike testing of the left ear. This is not the kind of nystagmus I just showed you for posterior canal BPPV. This is purely horizontal nystagmus beating towards the ground. If you see this and call it a positive dix hall -Pike test, well, you'd be incorrect, because a positive dix, dix hall -Pike test is only when you get vertical upward rotary nystagmus in posterior canal BPBV. If you have a patient with a story consistent with BPBV, but you see no nystagmus during the dix hall -Pike test, or you see purely horizontal nystagmus, you should perform the supine roll test to see if your patient has horizontal canal BPBV. It's easy to perform the supine roll test. Just lie the patient supine and then turn their head 90 degrees to one side and observe for nystagmus. When we tested this man with the supine roll test for the right ear, we again saw horizontal nystagmus beating towards the ground. That's called geotropic nystagmus. Don't confuse the nystagmus of horizontal canal BPBV, which changes direction depending on which way their head is turned, with spontaneous nystagmus, which changes direction with gaze, such as in this man. Spontaneous nystagmus that changes direction with gaze is a central pattern of nystagmus. Now back to horizontal canal BPBV. Just to make it a bit more confusing, it can also beat away from the ground on both sides. This is called apogeotropic nystagmus, a slightly different flavor of horizontal canal BPBV. It's important to note that if you only see horizontal nystagmus on one side of the supine roll test, it's not horizontal canal BPBV. The reason why it's important to recognize that horizontal nystagmus is not a positive dix hall -Pike test is because horizontal canal BPBV does not respond to the Epley maneuver, but it does respond to the Gafani maneuver. To learn more about how to diagnose and treat horizontal canal BPBV, a link is on your screen for my video to teach you all about it. If you want to consider yourself vertigo competent, you really need to know how to diagnose both posterior canal and horizontal canal BPBV with the dix hall -Pike test and the supine roll test, respectively. Now the third and last semicircular canal is the anterior canal, and during the dix hall -Pike test, anterior canal BPBV will demonstrate downward vertical nystagmus as shown here, and both sides will show this during the dix hall -Pike test. It's fairly rare, maybe 3% of BPBV, probably because the otoconia don't fall into the anterior canal very easily, and when they do, they easily fall out. But if you do see a patient with a story that sounds like BPBV, and you see vertical downward nystagmus during the dix hall -Pike test, they likely have anterior canal BPBV, and can be treated with a deep head hanging maneuver, as outlined in the video link on your screen. Rarely, this kind of nystagmus can be caused by various central causes of vertigo, so sending them to a vertigo-interested clinician would be appropriate if you have no luck in curing them. Now that I've shown you the pattern of nystagmus that can be seen in different types of BPBV during the dix hall -Pike test, there are still a few more ways that you can get confused by the dix hall -Pike test. The most common would be if you perform it on a patient who is experiencing ongoing continuous vertigo, which is worsened by head movement, nausea and or vomiting, 
difficulty walking, and spontaneous or gaze-evoked nystagmus. These patients are having the acute vestibular syndrome, or AVS. Most of them will be having vestibular neuritis, but some will be having a posterior circulation stroke, which is presenting with continuous vertigo and nystagma. And some of these strokes will have no other central features, as I outlined previously. And if you were to mistakenly perform the Dix-Halpike test on patients such as these, you will probably find that they describe a worsening of their vertigo and have a non-specific increase in their resting nystagmus. And this might lead you to think that your patient is having BPBV when they are really having vestibular neuritis, or even worse, a posterior circulation stroke presenting very much like vestibular neuritis. Here is an important clinical pearl. If you don't see nystagmus in patients complaining of constant vertigo for a number of days, you should remove fixation to see if this brings out subtle gaze of oak nystagmus. Most people with vestibular neuritis have very obvious spontaneous or gaze evoked nystagmus in the first couple of days of their illness, as seen in this man. And as expected with vestibular neuritis, he has an obvious catch up saccade when his head is turned rapidly in the opposite direction of the nystagmus. But some patients don't present until a number of days after their onset of vestibular neuritis. Their nystagmus can dramatically improve in the first few days. And it may be hard to detect subtle nystagmus when visual fixation is not removed. Most of us don't carry around Frenzel goggles or infrared goggles. However, we can still remove visual fixation in other ways. The easiest way is by simply asking the patient to look through a blank piece of paper placed close to one side of their head. You can't see nystagmus when this man is looking straight ahead. You might overlook that he has a very mild right beating nystagmus when he's asked to look to the right. But when a piece of paper is placed close to his head, the nystagmus becomes more evident. Just keep looking through the piece of paper if it's not there. No nystagmus is seen when he looks to the left, even when fixation is removed with a piece of paper. A catch up saccade is seen when his head is turned rapidly to the left, which is a positive imp head impulse test. And combined with a negative test of skew, he is overall hence peripheral and has vestibular neuritis. Vestibular migraine usually presents with a history of multiple episodes of dizziness over a substantial period of time with periods of wellness between them. The episodes can last from 5 minutes to 3 days or even longer. When questioned carefully about headache history, it becomes apparent they've had a number of migraine headaches in the past. Often patients are unaware that the frontal headaches they've been getting with nausea, vomiting, and photophobia or phonophobia, and visual blurring or other visual, visual symptoms are in fact migraine headaches. In vestibular migraine, at least half the dizzy episodes should have a migraineous feature associated with them. The most common one is photophobia. Some never get a migraine headache associated with their dizzy spell, and the migraineous feature can come at the beginning, middle, or end of their dizzy episode. The reason why I'm telling you so much about vestibular migraine is that because another thing about them is that during the dizzy spell, you don't often see spontaneous or gaze evoked nystagmus, and they often describe their dizziness as being brought on by position change. Sounding familiar? Sure, sounds like BPBV. But the dix hopike test will cause persistent nystagmus and the pattern won't be consistent with any variety of BPVV. So learn how to diagnose vestibular migraine, and you'll find the number of vertical patients you see without a diagnosis will drop considerably. The last way you can confuse yourself with performing the dix hopike test is if you happen to see the very rare patient that sounds like they have BPBV, but in fact have a central cause for their positional vertigo, which produces nystagmus on the dix hopike test. The most common nystagmus pattern seen in these rare patients is vertical downward nystagmus, which could be anterior canal BPBV, but if they aren't getting better with the deep head hanging maneuver, you should refer them to a vertigo interested specialist. Here's an example of vertical downward nystagmus caused by alcohol related cerebellar degeneration. In addition, apogeotropic nystagmus, which is beating away from the ground on both sides, can rarely be caused by central causes of vertigo. But horizontal canal BPBV is much more likely the cause, and central causes of vertigo don't get better with a Gafani maneuver. Most patients with a central cause of positional nystagmus have other features that wouldn't be consistent with BPBV, such as spontaneous downward nystagmus or diplopia, limb clumsiness, or focal weakness. To give you an idea of how rarely central causes can produce positional nystagmus, in this systematic review of 28 studies, they found only 82 cases of central causes of positional nystagmus. 
Remember that BPPV is the most common cause of vertigo in the world with millions of cases every year. And they state they found only one patient with a positive Dix Hall Pike test where the direction of the stagmus was characteristic of BPPV. But in fact, if you look up that paper by Neil Shulman, in their paper it was only stated that the Dix Hall Pike maneuver was positive with the head turned to the left. I was able to email Neil Sh uh, Shulman at ENT in Halifax, and he told me that in fact neither he nor his co-author had seen the patient in his initial presentation, and they obtained the case details from the chart, and there was no specifics of the nystagmus observed during the Dix-Halpike test. So millions of cases of posterior canal BPBV occur every year, and still we haven't found a single convincing case of a typical presentation of BPBV with well-described nystagmus of posterior canal BPBV that turns out to be anything but BPBV. Yet we do millions of CT heads on them just to be sure it's not a central cause. In summary then, rest assured that if you see the typical BPBV presentation with vertical upward rotary nystagmus on dix pike testing, you have the gold standard diagnosis of posterior canal BPBV. You can then stop worrying about a central cause and start curing them. If you see no nystagmus or purely horizontal nystagmus, perform the supine roll test. And if they have the nystagmus cons consistent with horizontal canal BPPV, they can be treated with the appropriate Gafani maneuver. If you see vertical downward nystagmus with the story consistent with BPPV, you can try the deep head hanging maneuver. But if they aren't getting better, refer them to vertigo specialists. If your patient has acute vestibular syndrome with spontaneous or gaze evoke nystagmus, then don't perform the Dix-Halpike test. You're only going to make your patient feel worse and confuse yourself. Remember to remove fixation with a piece of paper to see the subtle nystagmus in resolving acute vestibular syndrome. And learn how to recognize vestibular migraine. I've seen five cases in the past two months in the emergency department. Now I hear some of you saying, this is confusing, I can't learn all of this. And yes, for those who are just learning about vertigo or who studied the old method of evaluating vertigo, it can seem overwhelming. But in fact, if you see the undifferentiated vertigo patient, you're going to see BPBV, both posterior and horizontal canal BPBV, as well as vestibular neuritis and posterior circulation stroke and vestibular migraine. And if you don't know how to diagnose them clinically, the CT scan or MRI won't save you or your patient from misadventure. You need to learn these skills. Ask your colleagues who are confident in their bedside assessment of vertigo to show you how to do the head and pulse test and the rest of the HINTS exam. And I think the best way to learn these skills is to watch my videos, take notes while you do, and soon you'll actually be looking forward to seeing vertigo patients. Good luck, and thanks for watching.